good evening everybody uh, and uh, thank you very much for logging in today uh, and uh, giving us your precious time uh, you know i'm really delighted to host all of you in our uh, vantage series which is basically a master class on different topics uh, and to explore these different topics and concepts we normally get an expert who's uh, you know been doing it for a long time and is one of the uh, thinkers on 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 that particular topic so today we really have an extra special guest and uh, it's a topic which has been trending uh, which has been talked about uh, but at the same time um, uh, you know it's it's a complex subject and uh, i can tell you from personal experience that the more i read about it the more i learn about it the more confused i guess i get so to 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 elucidate some of the concepts uh, we've got somebody uh, you know who's an authority uh, on this subject uh, you know we've got uh, uh, with us today mr balaji srinivasan he's currently an angel investor and entrepreneur he was formerly the cto of coinbase uh, which uh, happened because he started a company called earn.com which got bought over by Coin coinbase for a rumored 100 million dollar um he was also the general partner at Anderson Horowitz and uh, co-founder of Council Teleport and Coin Center. He was named to the MIT Innovators Under 35, uh, and he's won several accolades and awards. He's an alumni of uh, Stanford University, where he did his uh, PhD in electrical uh, engineering. And he teaches the uh, massive online open class, which re reached in 2013. Uh, 250,000 students worldwide. He has uh, 33 lakh uh, Twitter followers. Um, and he, he basically, before he became an in angel investor, uh, an intellectual firebrand of the cryptocurrency community, he had co-founded a genetic testing company that eventually was sold for $375 million. So it's not very often that we use this, wor th this word these days because, you know, focus is something uh, you know, which which keeps which is which keeps trending. But I think you know he's he's a polymat. Uh, you know his his range of knowledge across various subjects is 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 really really uh, inspiring. Uh, now to join to join me in this conversation today, I have with me uh, Mr. Hari Srinivasan, who's a technology leader in one of the big four tech firms. Uh, you know, he's told me that he can't use uh, the name of the company on a public forum. So uh, he, he's a technology leader with a, with a big four, uh, one of the big four companies. But more importantly, he has two decades of experience uh, in the technology sector. Uh, I met him at Harvard Business School and I was really fortunate to meet him there because whatever little I've learned on cryptocurrencies, blockchain, is is really thanks to Hari. So I thought, you know, uh, Hari being in this conversation will will add a lot of intellectual value to this uh, session. Uh, so welcome, Hari, uh, you know, to this uh, uh, webinar, and uh, 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 you know, glad to have you here in this conversation. So without further ado, uh, I hand it over to Balaji, uh, who will take us through a brief uh, deck uh, for the next uh, twenty five odd minutes and. Uh, uh, you know, elucidate some of the concepts around uh, uh, cryptocurrencies, blockchain, um, and, and, you know, pose that, you know, Hari and I uh, will have the uh, chance to have a conversation and ask a lot of questions that I have been receiving personally as well from a lot of you who have logged into this uh, webinar to, to Balaji. And um, he is... Um, uh, uh, you know, founded a site recently by the name by the name of uh, 1729.com. This number should ring a bell for many many Indians. Uh, so we will have a chance to talk about this as well uh, late, later in our conversation. So uh, without further ado, uh, Balaji, over to you. Uh, we are all yours. Okay, great. Thank you very much. I'm going to project in a second. Okay. All right, let's see if this works. Okay, can you see the screen? Let's see. Uh, yeah, it's just coming on. Uh, I, I just forgot one thing before we start. 
uh, I just wanted to mention this, that this is a knowledge webinar. Whatever we discussed today should not be construed as investment advice. And everybody should uh, study these concepts on their own and make their decisions. So over to you, Balaji. Okay, great. Um, so, I'm sorry? Okay. Um, okay, so uh, this is a great introduction. Um, so thank you very much. Um, basically that's, um, that's me in a suit, a relatively rare occasion. Um, and uh, what I'm gonna talk today about is, just start with the history of cryptocurrency, introduce some concepts, talk about applications in 2020 and 2021, and then like kind of future applications in 2025. And can you see the screen, by the way? Okay. Yes, absolutely. Okay, great. All right, so first, um, let me start with the basics. If you only get one slide, uh, let's start with this one. And um, so uh, the basics, first Bitcoin. What is Bitcoin? Why was it invented? We can get there in four steps. So step one, physical cash. Um, so A hands B cash and B knows A no longer has it, all right? So this is something we take for granted when you're talking about dollar bills in the physical world or rupees. Um, there's a physical property where A is handing it to B and A no longer has it, okay? It can only be in one place at a time. If we try to transplant that naively to the digital world, if we take the serial numbers on that Federal Reserve note or that rupee, and we just try to email them to a friend and try to treat that as cash because that serial number is a unique marker on each bill, it doesn't work because A still has a copy of those numbers even after it is transmitted to, to B. Okay, so it's in, in, the, in the digital realm, you can copy things, but you can't provably transfer things, at least not in this peer-to-peer -peer fashion. So what happens is, um, you know, until the invention of Bitcoin, we introduced a third party, um, a bank or some actor that was bank-like, you know, that had a bank-like API that would debit A and credit B. And it was in this debit of A that scarcity was modeled in a digital system. And this seems almost inescapable. How would you be able to do it without that centralized actor? Um, but the downside of that centralized actor, it's inelegant from a computer science perspective because you've got a privileged node in the system. Um, that centralized actor, C, can you know, print themselves a bunch of money. They can block transactions. Um, there, there's lots of inelegancies of this. Uh, and what uh, Satoshi Nakamoto discovered and what essentially the last, you know, 11 years of blockchain innovation has been based on is an algorithm that takes that central actor and breaks their power into a bunch of pieces so that any one of a network of so-called miners can approve that debit and uh, credits, can, can basically let that transaction go through. All of these uh, can, can compete to get the transaction through. And if one of them decided not to approve it, one of the others would because um, they are incentivized uh, very significantly to do so. They get to mint themselves a little bit of currency. They, they credit themselves a little bit of Bitcoin when they do this. And so in this fashion, we've essentially invented a digital cash, something that has the peer-to-peer -peer like property where A can transfer it to B without a third party in the middle. You've reduced the number of necessary parties to get scarcity in digital realm back down from three to two just like it is in the physical realm, uh, so long as at least one of the miners is, is letting your transaction through, which is generally a good assumption. And so essentially what, what cryptocurrencies and blockchain are, they're a way to introduce scarcity natively into the digital realm. So you can have faithful high fidelity models of offline scarcity, which no one party can manipulate. And the reason this is so important is once you can do this for Bitcoin and you can say, you know, who has what amount of Bitcoin for a trillion dollars in Bitcoin, well, then you can do it for anything. Um, you can do it for stocks, you can do it for bonds, you can do it for basically any digital financial asset. And then you can potentially start applying it to other things like, you know, who possesses the, 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 um, a piece of real estate or the keys to a Tesla. Anything that's got a digital lock, for example, you can potentially also transmit in this fashion. And so essentially what this does, is it puts property rights on chain. And uh, there's, there's much more to it, but this is the fundamental concept of how you go from physical cash to decentralized digital cash. This is the motivation for the whole space. Okay, so that's why it was invented. Now, what people did is they realized that Bitcoin was um, something that you know, had a few different innovations in it. And one of those innovations, perhaps the most fundamental is innovation of a so-called blockchain, which is um, like it sounds like a, a chain of blocks where each block is composed of transactions. And um, it's essentially the history of an economy. 
Starting from t equals zero, the Genesis block in early 2009, every single transaction that's ever happened on the Bitcoin blockchain, every debit to A and credit to B is in a data structure. And you can literally replay the history of an entire economy down to the you know, 100 millionth of a BTC. You can track every fraction of a fraction of a, of a penny or equivalent. And so you can think of a blockchain as being a tamper resistant database for storing things of value. It's a fundamental innovation behind Bitcoin. And uh, what happened in 2014 was that uh, the concept of blockchain was generalized um, beyond just debits and credits of BTC. Um, it allowed for programs, smart contracts. And what's an example of a smart contract? Well, everybody here has probably done an Excel sheet where you know, A gets paid a certain amount and then uh, B takes a cut and then C takes a cut, you know, for example, a distribution deal or, you know, uh, like a venture capitalist when, when they get their carry, there's cuts that are going to multiple parties. There's some calculations involved. It's not as simple as just A sending five bucks to B. So smart contracts allow you to model that Excel-like logic on a blockchain where you're doing debits of A, credits of B. You can model interest, you can model, you know, dividends, all the type of stuff. And the Ethereum blockchain, which is the second most important blockchain after Bitcoin, um, has uh, one of its major innovations was it made programming those kinds of smart contracts much easier. If, if you look at the top, that's an example of a script in Bitcoin. Below is an example of how to code a script in Ethereum Solidity. Even without knowing what these things do, you can see that this looks more you know, readable than, than this, right? Um, it looks like JavaScript. It's not exactly JavaScript, but it looks like it. Okay. And this led to, among other things, the ICO boom. Um, from 2017 to 2018, there's a huge ICO boom and bust. Like the dot-com boom, many of these projects won't work, but some will. And you know, that entire thing, you know, ICOs, um, now people call them token sales, but ICOs were the simultaneous disruption of venture capital, SWIFT, crowdfunding, and cap tables. Why? Because new kinds of you know, capital was coming in, not just venture capital from Sandhill. It was coming over a new international payment rail, not just SWIFT. It was destroying all crowdfunding records because in 2015, a large online crowdfund was like $10 million. By 2017, 2018, it was like $4 billion, like a 100x increase in a few years. And it reinvented cap tables because um, a large cap table was, you know, maybe a thousand people in the US, but overseas, uh, or, or rather on, on chain, you can get to tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of people. Okay. And now starting in 2020, 2021, uh, the return, the entire market has come all the way back. Here was the last, you know, boom and bust. And, and the thing is, once you've lived through some of these, that little ripple over here, that was a very big deal for those of us who lived through that. <clears throat> and then there's even other ones that are further back. And so uh, it's quite possible that this boom makes this last boom look like this, this little almost imperceptible ripple over here. We'll see what happens. It's very rare, by the way, that you have anything that's at $2 trillion that looks like this. You know, Apple does not look like this. Apple looks like it's kind of asymptoted out. It's not like basically vertical looking at $2 trillion. And we'll see how high it goes, but, um, you know, it feels like we still have 10 or 100x left because there's about um, maybe 100 million people worldwide who own some cryptocurrency, but there's 3 billion users of Facebook. So we, we still have a, a ways to go potentially. So now some concepts, right? So basically uh, just on the technology end, um, you can think of a blockchain, as I mentioned, as a database for storing things of value, right? So there's cryptocurrencies, uh, you know, digital gold or digital cash. There's so-called tokens, ERC-20 tokens. These are digital alternatives to equity. Um, you can do digital assets like the so-called NFTs, non-fungible assets, whether it's crypto art or in-game items, real estate. And you can do things like identity, you know, like proof of identity. This is actually built in, just like the blockchain is this data structure that you can kind of abstract out of Bitcoin. Another thing that, you know, blockchains have as an implicit thing is they have a kind of identity because you have to sort of prove to the blockchain that you own some cryptocurrency before it'll let you move the coins on chain. You can abstract that itself out into its own thing, like a crypto identity. And um, so anything that's really valuable, right? Digital gold, digital equity equivalents, digital assets, digital identity, those are the kinds of things you want to store on chain because it requires some compute, but if it's valuable, you want to put it on chain. Um, and uh, a very, very powerful concept is that, you know, Bitcoin and these other crypto protocols are literally protocols um, in the sense that you can open up something like Wireshark, you can monitor the individual packets 
And you can see like a block here being mined. And if you've heard of TCP IP, that's, you know, TCP transmission control protocol, here's IP, you can go down to see the actual bytes on the wire. But the point is that if you're a computer scientist, you can actually see the raw packets flying back and forth between computers that represent payments. Now, the amazing thing about this is this is transmission of value without any reference to a country or to a bank or to a national currency. It's pure bytes, okay? It has digitized value in the same way that um, you, know, you took a book and you turned it into a stream of bytes. You know, we talk about an ebook and a book. Uh, and the fact that this has no bank or country associated with it, you've decentralized the control of the currency away from these centralized institutions and just purely on a computer network. Now, it's very exciting when you've reduced something to just a string of bytes because you can program with it. You can do all kinds of things with it. So that's actually one of the remarkable things about this. It's actually literally a protocol. Payments are now packets. And if you think about the previous revolution where we turned things into packets, the internet revolution, we were able to turn books and movies and music and all these other things into packets. Now we're turning stocks and bonds and mortgages and everything else, derivatives into packets. So that's basically the, the uploading of Wall Street, the programmability of Wall Street. Okay. So one consequence of this is machines can now hold and send money. Like a program can actually hold money. In the same way that a program can send and receive emails for you in the background or send and receive information, like your phone receives push notifications, now you can have a program that actually goes and makes money for you in your sleep. It can actually go and send and receive money and actually hold it. Um, you can have a device like a self-driving car that actually goes around and picks up passengers and pays for its own gas and does so autonomously. That's a, that's a new thing, you know, to like, like a program that can actually hold money. And when I say that, I mean that string of bytes over here is like loading money into a program. So it's like a new way of, of writing code, which has currencies. It's a prerequisite for certain kinds of intelligent agents. Now, in terms of areas that blockchains have actually improved, it's, you know, some people say, oh, you know, what are blockchains actually fixed? Well, there are actually 10x or more improvements in many different areas of the financial system. For example, the simplest is gold. You know, Bitcoin is definitely 10x lighter than gold, faster to transport, cheaper to custody. Um, Ethereum and stable coins are 10x faster than SWIFT. If you sent a wire transfer with SWIFT, it can take days for it to clear internationally, whereas with Ethereum, um, I can send USDC or a stable coin over Ethereum and it'll clear in minutes. And, you know, we can talk on the phone and I can see the thing register in the blockchain and, and the transaction is done. It's about as fast as an email or, or a little bit slower than that, but that's way, way faster than Swift, which is more like sending a physical letter. Then a third, you know, Kickstarter. So basically Ethereum, you know, and, uh, and other crypto platforms have shattered internet crowdfunding records. Um, and it's 10x faster than Delaware. If you want to incorporate something, it takes days to go and set up a new Delaware C corporation in the US or to incorporate in India or any place like that. But it can take only minutes, um, it's fractions of a second generated address or minutes to get a smart contract on chain. And so you have, you know, like a much greater than 10x speed in terms of quote incorporation, right? It's like the difference between setting up a website versus getting a printing press. Like that reduction in speed and cost is a big deal. So in many different areas, I could go to more like, you know, the number of simultaneous people you can send to. You can send to like a thousand people, 10 bucks in different countries, and your account won't get frozen and neither will theirs. Um, you can write programs with this stuff, which you can't as easily do with banking APIs and so on and so forth. Um, essentially, these are um, many different kinds of 10, sometimes 100 or 1,000 X improvements in different corners of the financial system all at the same time. Okay. Number five, blockchains have already created many billion dollar entities. So especially coin founders, miners, and exchanges have all been raking in billions of dollars, now really tens of billions of dollars. And those are like the biggest early hits. Um, think of this as sort of like the infrastructure era of the internet, but um, there's, there's gonna be much more. You know, these are, these are like the early areas and, and, and there's others that are, that are coming um, and are already here in some ways with the other protocols. Number six, you know, it's often said that blockchains are, you know, about trustlessness and that's true, but another way of thinking about it is that they are about, a, they give you a choice of who to trust, right? Before you had to store money at a bank, now you can store it at a bank, you can store it at Coinbase, or you can literally keep it resident locally on your own computer, okay? And you can essentially, just like you can go to the ATM and pull your physical cash out, right now you can't go to PayPal or your banking interface and download the balance to your local laptop. 
you can do that with Bitcoin. You can do that with cryptocurrency. That concept of like downloading the balance locally, you can just like you can download a PDF from a banking website, you cannot, however, download the currency locally. That's a fundamental concept of what it means to be decentralized. Like you don't actually have to have that bank holding it. You can hold it on your own devices. And so once you can do that, once you don't have to trust, then actually paradoxically you trust more. Because you don't have to trust them, um, because you can pull your currency out, well, actually, that means that you um, have got recourse, right? And you know that there's other people who would have pulled their money out if this had been a bad actor or that you have that option. And so in a sense, greater decentralization also enables greater trust in some ways in centralization because you have that exit, you have that option. So blockchains give you a choice of who to trust. Number seven, as I mentioned before, blockchains enable internet scale cap tables. You know, the concept of a cap table or a capitalization table, that's basically who owns what stock and what shares of stock. In a sense, a cap table is the most important data structure in Silicon Valley um, because it determines who makes what money when, when an exit happens, when an IPO happens. And before cap tables, these super important data structures were mostly managed in Excel by lawyers and a few shareholders, you know, were, were um, would always get messed up. And these basically had very poor visibility, limited liquidity until the time of IPO. Now, um, essentially the, that cap table has moved on chain and you've gone from a few hundred holders to tens of thousands. Uh, the, the tokens over here, they're not the same as equity because they can actually be used in programs, whereas the shares of a company cannot be. However, in other ways, they do appreciate as the value of the protocol increases. And so now, you know, you can basically um, give users a piece of cap tables in a totally programmatic way. This is a, this is a new thing. Um, you can increase the scale of alignment by 10, 100, 1,000 X over what it was before. And if a few thousand or a few hundred aligned people built all these Silicon Valley tech companies, what happens when we can align a few hundred thousand or a few million people? That's a very new thing. Okay. Um, oops. Let's see your skin. All right. Eight. So blockchain first is the new mobile first. Basically, there are many different kinds of applications from you know, the obvious ones like precious metals and P2P payments that have blockchain disruptors, um, but there's more that's also coming. Identity, distributed databases, marketplaces, even things we didn't normally think of as venture fundable like DNS, all of those can go on chain. Number nine, um, blockchains break network effects. So before something like PayPal uh, or rather Facebook, you know, if you had a huge uh, network um, you know, and, and you had a built out network, well, it was very difficult for, to, for a startup to compete because they would start with a small network and the value of a social network or two set of marketplaces is low when the network is small, but high when the network is big. So it's hard to compete with a new social network. Crypto gives you a new tool to deal with this because you can mint a token and you can issue that to your users. And you can say, look, if our, you know, our, our, our company or our protocol gets big, then your token will be more valuable. So even if the network isn't that valuable yet, it could be valuable in the future. And there's more upside to the token initially than there is later. So this gives a new offsetting term in the same way that an early investor in Snapchat would make more money than a later investor in Snapchat if it was successful. An early user of a next generation token-based social network will make more money than a user, an early user of, um, of one without because or than, than a later user, because they, they took more risk with their labor rather than their capital. They, they put their time in. And you know it might be the case that that time is only worth $25 of tokens rather than $25,000 of tokens, but that's still something. You know, the earliest you know, users of Facebook actually gave a tremendous value by, by making it viral at a crucial time. And people now recognize that those invites, that evangelism has value, and now they can actually get paid for it. Um, and they can get something for helping a startup grow. This is a very new thing. It's a crowbar to break the network effects of two-sided marketplaces and social networks that are at scale. Number 10, blockchains transform social networks. So you know, for the last 10 years, people have been liking and poking each other. Um, but for the next 10 years, it's going to be paid DMs. It's going to be tasks. It's going to be all that type of stuff. And basically I say, you know, haha, we're going from... Um, like, you know, having, uh, having fun to making money, right? Forget making friends, we're going to make money now, right? Um, so from social networks to digital economies where the edges now have cryptocurrencies on them. 
Number 11, blockchains are a partial move away from the cloud towards privacy. So with all these hardware wallets, people are moving funds locally and people are learning to keep their private keys local and private. And that means they're an anchor that will lead to other data also being encrypted and moved locally out of, out of the cloud and onto local devices. So um, there's, how are we doing on time, by the way? Um, yeah, we're doing good on time. I think um, another five minutes, we can get into our conversation. Okay, great. All right. So let me talk a little bit more about, uh, you know, concepts on the community side of things. Um, a blockchain's value derives from its community. If you remember my point about how blockchain scale cap tables, um, the holders, developers, miners, other community members, they all agree between themselves and mechanisms of value transfer. The price is how they interface to the outside world. So there's Bitcoin Maximus, Ethereumers, you know, Ripplers, et cetera, or XRP Army. And one way of thinking about this is if you take three random people, they're not economically aligned. They can lose or win separately of each other. There's two of the third possible outcomes. You know, it can be lose, 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 win, et cetera. If, however, they all own the same cryptocurrency, they're literally aligned in the sense they all lose or win together. And so that's actually this very important point where you can start sewing together different people um, and having them all win or lose as a group with cryptocurrencies. And so blockchains take us from a slippery slope to a crypto cliff where property becomes harder to seize because to seize property from one person, you seize it from everybody. Um, basically, you know, if, if someone takes a, you know, the cat domain, the internet you know, uh, domain for Catalonia, you could take one at a time. You get foo.cat and bar.cat and baz.cat. Um, but if you take even one, for example, Ethereum name like foo.eth, then everybody loses there. So there's a, there's a social dynamic which makes it hard to seize property, right? And so blockchains are actually allowing for experiments in effectively self-governance. You have communities that are setting up property rights and communications channels and being able to trade back and forth. And this is actually pretty interesting because it makes macroeconomics and experimental science. All of these video games and so on have come somewhat close to this where you know there's, there's gold that you'll earn by defeating monsters and people have studied inflation and deflation within these virtual economies. But now you're actually putting real money in and you're making it possible to trade externally. And so whatever your thesis on economics, whether you support inflationary or deflationary economics or what have you, now if you can get enough people to try it, you can actually run real macroeconomic experiments, which is a big deal. It makes macroeconomic, macro more of an experimental science. Um, tens of millions of people are invested in these experiments, you know, and uh, it's all happening in real time. Um, and the crypto economic experiments, the ones that succeed, gain more users. This is from actually a while ago. Um, but basically, the more the, the more they succeed, the, the bigger they get. And so you can think of this as like a laboratory of networks where as different um, you know, people contest, uh, you know, you, you have different kinds of economic policies being played out and people just opt in or opt out and they choose different networks at a time. Now, I've got a ton of applications I can go through. Um, maybe I can do that whirlwind tour or should I pause for questions? Yeah, I think we can uh, pause for questions and then uh, sure. go into it a bit later. Uh, Malaji, I think that was a fairly uh, you know, useful presentation and sets the context for our conversation. I'm going to be asking a few very, very simple questions and I'll let Hari ask the intelligent ones. Uh, so one of the questions that, I, that, that we often keep getting asked is uh, even central banks have got, got, got pretty nervous about the entire cryptocurrency uh, system and uh, they've they have started uh, issuing their I think China is the first to experiment with central central digital currency uh, would that be a competitor in any sense and how do you view that um say, say one more time like um the central bank it. issuing digital currency directly yeah so um I, I don't think it's a competitor at all in fact I think actually it's a huge endorsement of the whole thing it's like you know, when a government sets up a website, that's kind of an endorsement of the internet. And uh, there's no question that, you know, this thing that was mocked and, you know, people said that it was, um, you know, like nothing, uh, you know, people, Aaron said, oh, Bitcoin is not important or Bitcoin is going to die and so on. And now everybody from the World Bank to the Chinese government, to the IMF, um, every, there's not a single person in finance, in technology, in, in banking, in government that doesn't know about Bitcoin and blockchain, right? And hasn't heard about it a lot, right? 
So clearly there's something very important happening here. It's a huge innovation. So that's like one aspect in which it's, it's an endorsement. The second is that um, I think these are just going to proceed in tandem because what's going to happen, we're entering now an age of global monetary competition. One way to think about this is with the advent of Google News in the early 2000s, I believe it was 2002. I may be wrong, but I think it was 2002. Suddenly every paper in the US and then eventually the world was put into competition with each other. And what happened was like the Miami Herald or the Kansas City Star had actually been getting by on reprinting national news. And they all reprinted like the AP wire, for example, right? Now, now once I was all on Google News, it was all indexed. It was obvious that there were 700 reprints of the same story and you didn't really need to see the same copy reprinted in 700 places. And so what happened was the value prop of local news started to collapse because they didn't have that much unique local news. All the national news could be pulled out. And you know we're still living through that kind of basically collapse of local news in the US and the, um, the, the best media companies managed to do okay, but everybody was put into competition in a way they weren't before, right? And, and of course, a lot of new news sources arose, you know, all these blogs and so on and so forth. And so the same thing is about to happen to every currency because a digital wallet, what people haven't fully taken on board, a digital wallet holds digital currencies, right? And once you can hold one currency or a few on your laptop, as you can with Ethereum, right? You, you open up an Ethereum wallet, you can hold a bunch of currencies because just a, it's literally just a debit or a credit. It's a few bytes of information, right? Once you can hold one or two, you can hold a thousand. And when you can hold a thousand, you can hold uh, rupees and you can hold, um, you know, potentially if you can get the wallets for these, by the way, so it might be locked down to citizens, but you could hold rupees, you could hold the Brazilian real, the digital real, you could hold, uh, you know, digital pounds, you could hold all of these different things and you have digital stocks, digital bonds, just, just imagine just like how many apps you have, you might have even more than that in terms of different digital currencies locally, right? Just, just think about your portfolio. You know, you have, you know, this stock and that stock and you have this bond and that bond. Now it's all digital, but it's all local on your computer. And the, the thing that, that is happening now, by the way, a technology that I didn't talk about, but it's very important is there's new crypto technologies that allow any of these assets to be traded for any of the other assets at some price, right? And the reason that's important is um, if you have, um, I'm trying to give a good example, if you have a share of some private company stock, okay, you cannot necessarily in one hop convert that into Japanese yen. You need to find a buyer in India to give you rupees and you have to do rupees to yen or something like that, for example, right? Um, the new technology called uh, like decentralized market making or decentralized exchanges or AMMs, automated market makers, basically give a quote for pretty much any liquid pair. So you can just directly swap between that. If there's a digital version of that private company stock and a digital yen, digital Japanese yen, you could just swap between them. And that actually, what that does is actually also reduces the need for cash at all, because you don't even need to move from your digital stock into rupees and then from rupees into the digital yen, you could just go directly, right? So what is about to happen is every currency and every asset in the world is going to be put into competition with every other asset. Now, to some extent, this already exists, right? If you're moderately wealthy, you know, you are thinking about balancing your portfolio, right? Just like people who were moderately informed in the 80s or 90s, they got multiple newspapers, you know? But now you need to thousand X that in terms of the number or more in terms of the number of assets. And then another thousand X or more in terms of the number of people who have that many assets, the sheer complexity of these protocols, just like the complexity of information sources. I mean, how many different periodicals did you read in the eighties or nineties versus today? It's easily a thousand X, right? In terms of the number of different authors you're getting per day. In the same way, you're gonna have a thousand X increase on many dimensions on the number of different currencies you have, the number of people who have those and so on and so forth. So why do I bring this up? Well. Um, you know, a, a, every nation is going to get their own digital currency, just like they've got a digital website. You know, that's basically if you deal with information, you're going to need to use the internet. If you deal with money, you're going to need to understand the blockchain. Um, and those currencies are going to have to compete now in a different way. Right now, you don't think of, let's say, the rupee and the pound and uh, the Swiss franc and the real um, all competing with each other. Right? I mean, there's Forex guys who do trade them against each other, but you don't think of them as being in direct competition. In the not too distant future, because anybody will be able to hold anybody else's currency, all currencies are in competition with each other. 
And they're not just in competition on the basis of monetary policies, but on the basis of other policies like privacy, right? How private is this wallet, right? How programmable is it? How scalable is it? How many transactions per second can I do? Can I do small transactions and big ones? Uh, how, what's the adoption of it? And so on and so forth, right? And I wrote a post, you know, how India legalizes crypto that goes into this concept of global monetary competition. And so once you think about it that way, you realize, okay, it's really not just about one row in this, in this so-called DeFi matrix of everything against everything. There's one row, which is Bitcoin. There's another row, that's digital rupee. It's all versus all. That's what's coming. So let me pause there. Right. So uh, uh, one of the critiques of, of, of Bitcoin and digital currencies is, is that, you know, you're creating a parallel system. And it becomes very difficult for governments to track the flow of transactions. So, you know, money laundering or, you know, illegal use of these, these currencies. And secondly, uh, you know, uh, how viable is mining now? Because the power costs have really shot up. And is it really viable to mine these currencies anymore? These are a couple of questions that I gathered from, uh, you know, our Q&A box. Sure. So, so let me talk about the second one first. So most Bitcoin mining nowadays uses renewable energy. Um, and in fact, actually, it's a very powerful way of taking stranded um, resources on the grid and turning them into um, effectively money because you have some you know, stochastic source of power that it may not match up with demand in the power grid. And batteries aren't actually that good. You can't really store a huge amount of energy necessarily, but you can Bitcoin mine. You can Bitcoin mine anywhere and you can increase the load up or down as people see fit. So people have used this to, for example, eliminate flare and natural gas pipelines to take excess wind power that's being generated during inconvenient times, turn them to BTC. So it is a potential load balancing tool for the grid that actually makes renewables more price competitive, number one. Number two is there's other kinds of algorithms like proof of stake that do not use com compute for consensus and that are complementary. And so um, it's not, uh, it's not a necessity to consume energy for decentralized, you know, uh, blockchains. It just matters what, what consensus algorithm you're using. Um, to your first point, in terms of you know whether governments you know can can do this, well, I mean, there's a different way of thinking about it, which is um, you have NSA surveillance, right? You have mass surveillance of the whole world. You have something where um, people can't opt out of that, and you have the English law tradition of hey, you need a warrant before you can go and search somebody. Um, you need something, some form of privacy online because by default, anything you do should be private um, unless somebody has a good reason to peer into it. And so the flip side of this is actually what has been illegal or certainly overstretched is the degree of surveillance of people on everyday activities is slurping up as Snowden documented. And even in the US, um, people said, well, actually what the NSA was doing was illegal, even if it hasn't changed. And certainly overseas, Indians didn't want to be surveilled by the NSA, right? There's no election, there's no democratic rationale for some foreign country surveilling you. So that's the flip side of it is you're talking about essentially protecting people from these surveillance states. And, you know, yeah, if you've got a search warrant, okay, fine. But, you know, being able to slurp up everything, that's actually not, you know, what, what constitutional governments are supposed to be able to do. They're supposed to be limited in their powers. And, and that's one of the things that this does on the flip side of that, right? It essentially protects human rights against these potential abuses. Uh, so un unfortunately, currently the, our Indian government has banned cryptocurrencies. Uh, so if somebody uh, would like to hold uh, some of these currencies overseas, right? What's the best and safest way of doing it? Because one of the other fears that people have is we keep hearing about, you know, wallets being hacked and, uh, uh, you know, uh, so how do you, how do you hold these currencies? What's the safest way? And the other thing is, it's very complex. Like you said, there are so many options out there. So for somebody who's starting off, what's the best way to understand, uh, you know, how to, how to build a portfolio of these currencies? Well, so, you know, to my knowledge, uh, India actually has not banned cryptocurrency. It's rumored that it's going to try to ban it again. Um, but there's a serious, you know, like discussion on this exact issue. So this is a live issue right now. And I encourage you to raise your voice on it because um, it'll be considered, uh, it's, it's literally like banning the internet. Um, that's the only comparison I can make. It's as if in the 1980s or early 1990s, the FCC in the US had said, wow, all these people can broadcast online. They're gonna need television licenses for that. We can't let that happen. 
oh my God, you know, the post office says, oh my God, they're sending mail online. Well, they're going to need a license because only a licensed postal carrier can do this, you know, or, uh, you know, they need a radio license. They can broadcast audio online. They need a telephony license. They can make telephone calls online. Um, that would have been a huge mistake. And any countries that went and did that would have just lost the future. And that's, that's basically um, India's at a crossroads right now where this $2 trillion crypto economy, if it bans it, it's, it's just banning Indians from it. And in fact, actually, it's banning poorer Indians from I mean, access. You've written, about it. You've, written, you've written about it. I've seen your yes, I've written about this. And, and the thing is, you know, to your second point, the reason like a quote crypto ban in India is actually just a tax on the poor is that anybody of modest, you know, like moderate to wealthy means will just, you know, buy, figure out indirect ways to get exposure. For example, you know, the Indian government is probably not going to ban you holding MicroStrategy, the stock, right? Which is essentially basically a container around holding a lot of Bitcoin. They're probably not going to ban you from investing in Tesla. They're probably not going to ban you from investing in venture capital funds that can invest in crypto. They're probably not going to ban you from holding shares in foreign companies that buy crypto. There's going to be some workaround, right? Where you know you you're paying some fee effectively, you're essentially buying crypto at a markup, but it's still legal. And so all you've just done is you've done a license raj thing where you've made it unaffordable for regular Indians, which I don't think is a good idea because it's not going to be banned in the rest of the world since a number of financial centers are seeing huge benefits from having crypto uh, companies there. Um, so so that that is kind of how I think about like the ban as well as kind of these vehicles. And you asked about complexity. I think if anybody's starting out, you should use an exchange, you know, Coinbase, obviously I, I'm, I'm somewhat biased. I, I think it's quite good. Um, you should use an exchange and get started there. But then you should learn how to use like a local wallet. I mean, one way of thinking about it is in the 1980s, um, words like, uh, I don't know, RAM or a hard drive or bandwidth, those were arcane. You know, th those are the province of computer nerds. And 20, 30 years later, 40 years later, everybody knows them um, because you just need them. And in the same way, if you're putting off learning what blockchains are and forks and private keys and all the type of stuff, you shouldn't because every asset is going to go on chain. So this, so it's not a waste of time to learn about it is what I'm saying. Yeah, start with a centralized exchange, but install a wallet and then move stuff locally to uh, to learn how the whole system works, send and receive to your friends, et cetera. All right, thanks a lot. Uh, Hari, uh, over to you. Sure, thanks Ashish. Uh, that was very informative, Balaji. Thank you. Uh, so I'm sure many of them here have a question in their mind. If you look at uh, Bitcoin in Feb 2011, it was $1. And as it stands today, it's gone well past the $50,000 mark. Uh, and if you look at the ownership of Bitcoin, there's a generational divide. 30% of the younger generation owning it, 3% possibly of the elder generation owning it. So is this really the fear of missing out that is driving the asset price? What is really driving it up? Oh, I think it's much more than fear of missing out. I mean, for Bitcoin, at least, Bitcoin's value is seizure resistance, right? If, I mean, think about India has had, as I mentioned in my article or one of the articles, India has had a multi-millennia love affair with gold, right? Indians get gold, you know, it's part of the culture, it's part of jewelry. It is also cash that you can carry, right? In a serious, you know, get out of Dodge scenario, you can take a bunch of money out of the country or, you know, with you on a trip or something that people needed in, you know, previous centuries, right? Like that was, that was a thing, you know, they, they needed to just take the wealth on their other person. And many countries, of course, have a tradition of gold. It's an international thing, right? China's into gold, right? The UK is into gold. Gold has been a human um, thing for a long time. And what Bitcoin does is it's basically digital gold. And so uh, the reason that um, people like it is they like it for many of the same reasons they like gold. It is effectively a bearer instrument, right? You can carry it on your person. Nobody can take it from you unless they seize it from you physically. Um, it is suitable for storing large amounts of money. It is uh, universally accepted because it's internationally accepted and so on and so forth, right? So, um, so that's something which I, I don't think of it as you know, FOMO or not, you know, not completely FOMO, where the FOMO is, it's basically the speculation on how high the thing will go, you know, 
And depending on how you think about it, is it just a replacement for gold? I think it's actually going to be considerably bigger than where gold is. And the reason is that gold is like a few trillion, but um, gold is not currently at the center of the world economy in the way that gold used to be, right? Gold, gold in the pre-modern era was something that every central bank, uh, central bank still keep stockpiles of gold, but you know, gold was the way that they settled debts with each other. They didn't use fiat currency across borders and, and whatnot. Like the, it was much more central to the economy. People regularly needed it. Private individuals dipped into it. It was the quote central bank was how much gold you have, the decentral bank effectively. Uh, and now we're going back to that future. And in that, if, if we're going back to that future with the digital gold, then digital gold is going to be way more valuable than gold is. It might be 10x more valuable than gold is or 100x because the world economy is then centered around this digital gold. You know, that's the backhaul that, that goes across borders um, when you want to send a million dollars. And you might not ever do that. You might not do that send very frequently. It might be that Bitcoin is only used for very high denomination transactions by 2030 or 2035. You know, personal Bitcoin transactions may be very rare. Every transaction might cost a thousand dollars, but it would be, or, or the equivalent in fiat um, or more, but it would be something where you could send $50 million. And so it'd be like a backhaul, you know, for gigantic quantities of money to move around the world. Got it. Got it. You, you call it the new equivalent of gold. Uh, I take that. Uh, Bitcoin, most importantly, has shown that it's practically feasible uh, to have large scale disintermediation based on public ledgers. It's been able to establish and grow it as well. Uh, there hasn't been a strong regulatory framework here. Uh, in the US, uh, it, it, ACC has now begun to recognize it as a security. Uh, in India, uh, it isn't recognized yet as a security. Uh, how do you see regulators around the world evolving in uh, understanding this cryptocurrency? It's new to them. And how do you see them playing a role here? Yeah, so I want to correct some mis um, misstatements or whatever you there is a regulatory framework for it in different countries. It depends on what asset you're talking about, but you can think of something where the older the asset, the more established the regulatory framework is, and then it gets more, you know, like gray or, or question mark as, as the thing becomes newer. Um, but Bitcoin is definitely not a security. It's not considered to be a security by the SEC. So that's like also, you know, something I want to correct there um, because it's not, it's not issued by any company, you know, it is quote decentralized and actually, um, Hinman actually said in a talk a few years ago that Ethereum is also decentralized, you know? So it's possible for these things to become decentralized enough that they're not securities. Securities issued by a central actor, you know, a recognizable company to often finance their things. Whereas a decentralized crypto network, it's more like water or air. No one person controls it, you know? Um, in terms of like, you know, regulatory clarity and whatnot, basically, uh, you know, again, with the internet analogy, you could say, oh, the internet is great for making phone calls. So we should regulate it like telephony or, hey, you could broadcast TV shows on here. So we should regulate it like TV or, oh, actually you can send mails with the internet. So we need to regulate it like the post office, right? And so in this fashion, people around the world, it's like the, you know, the tail of the elephant and the tusk of the elephant and the leg of the elephant, you know, the famous fable where everybody's touching a piece and they're thinking this represents the whole. Um, various regimes, you know, countries around the world have variously deemed crypto or Bitcoin, um, you know, commodities or securities or currencies or this or that, right? And it's all because they're trying to pattern match it onto this past kind of thing. Um, I do think that that eventually modernizes as more 20 and 30 somethings become 40 and 50 somethings and get, you know, into the halls of power. Um, but right now, people are just trying to uh, like smash a square peg into a round hole. It's a little bit like saying, um, is this car a big horse or a small horse, which, you know, part of the Department of Horses should regulate it. Well, actually, those regulations are 100 years old and maybe they're outmoded completely. And maybe we need to junk them and start from from, you know, scratch, just like you didn't need a TV license to broadcast on YouTube and you didn't need a radio license to do a podcast and you don't need a postal uh, carrier badge to send an email maybe we can scrap those 20th century things and think about, you know, something from a fresh start. Maybe we can leapfrog. Got it. Uh, you've also written about what India should be doing, uh, which is legalizing crypto uh, and under the uh, Foreign Exchange Management Act. Uh, do you want to just 
shed a few light on that? Sure, sure. Yeah. So, I mean, that's one pathway, and it just it's just meant to give a constructive suggestion. I'm open to edits, right? But the ba- basic thing is that you know the two biggest things for India that have made it rise over the last thirty years are a economic liberalization and b the internet, and crypto combines these. It is literally economic liberalization v two via the internet. Um, and one of the lessons India learned during liberalization is that uh, you know the transition from the sort of emergency era, like like the FIRA to to FEMA, um, I, I always get them mixed up, but, I, but I'm pretty sure FEMA is the more liberal one. Um, the that that transition was um, a very important thing for India because um, you, you essentially people what they were trying to do is um, lock the currency down because they were scared of it, you know, leaving the country. And this kind of grasping, sort of controlling thing meant that currency didn't want to come into the country because if it couldn't get out, if you couldn't get an exit, why would you invest, right? Imagine, you know, a company that says you will never be able to sell your stock or exit. Well, okay. It's not that I want to sell right away, but I might want to sell in five years or 10 years and be a long-term holder. But at some point I might want to cash out and invest in something else. And if you are not able to withdraw the money, you're not going to put it in the first place. And so these basic points of enlightened self-interest took a while for the state to catch up to, but they did. And they, you know, for example, the LRS, the liberalized remittance scheme has been a pretty big success overall, you know, and they've recently, I think they increased the caps on it or what have you. And in the same way, I mean, whether you're a free marketer or a mercantilist, um, in the world that we're about to enter, India is going to have massive net inflows of capital. The reason is it's got hundreds of millions of people who've just come online and India is young and India is number three in startup unicorns and Indians are great at doing remote work and they're all connected to the internet now. And so essentially all of this remote work money, all of this remittance money will flow into India and crypto will make it flow into India, make it easier to make it flow into India if it's allowed to flow into India. So as a mercantilist, you'd say, great, all this money is flowing in. As a free marketer, you might say, well, it's fine if it's flowing in or flowing out because either way it's gonna be voluntary transactions. But these two views actually line up because for this decade, at least, think of India as a digital factory. Every job in the world can now be done remote. India has hundreds of millions of remote workers and it has crypto. So you can put all those things together and you can have anybody in India doing jobs around the world for crypto, which is a completely new thing. You know, that's, that's a much bigger deal than it even was a few years ago. Got it. Moving on to a slightly different topic. So there is a new class of digital assets. It's called the non-fungible tokens. Uh, and of late, we have seen it's get a surge in popularity. It's generated $300 million in sales and uh, just a single digital artwork got $70 million. So can you tell us more about NFTs and what's driving uh, the economics of uh, this new digital asset? Sure. So NFTs are actually it's not just crypto art, which is one application of NFTs. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's bigger than that because an NFT just means a so-called non-fungible token. It's actually a very technical term. But basically, you know, for example, dollar bills are fungible, but plots of land are not. You know, location matters. Every, every house is not interchangeable with every other house. It has different qualities. Where it is physically matters, you know? um, whereas any dollar bill or any other rupee is basically the same. So we would say dollar bills or rupees are fungible, whereas real estate is non-fungible, you know? And so representing non-fungible assets on chain is the concept of non-fungible token. And yes, that can be a piece of art, but it could also be uh, the login to a website um, or uh, it could be a potion for a video game or many other things. And, uh, you know, my general take on NFTs is I'm not sure, uh, in fact, I would be surprised if many of these crypto art pieces uh, retain their value in the open market because you know there isn't scarcity on minting of them. Number one and number two is they're going to kind of fall out of the attention cycle at some point. But I do think that the engineering concept of NFTs will endure because um, it's just a way of representing a different kind of scarcity online, right? Um, you know, for example, you know you could use an NFT to re- represent your Twitter username, and then you could buy and sell that back and forth. And if you possessed it, then you could log into Twitter as, you know, at Hari, right? Or at Ashish. And that would be valuable because right now, username trading is actually quite difficult to do. So 
uh, that that's kind of where I see NFTs going. I think they're a valuable technology. I'm not super uh, bullish on the current manifestation in terms of selling art, and I wouldn't consider them identical to just being able to sell art with them. But I do think they're going to create a lot of value in the medium to long term by by representing things that weren't previously representable uh, digitally. Maybe Got I can that. take one more question, if that's okay. Sure. Okay. Uh, so uh, maybe I'll, I'll go with this and then hand it back to Ashish. Uh, so there is constant disruption that's happening in technology. Uh, very recently, Google announced quantum supremacy. So is there a real threat of all of this to crypto assets and cryptocurrencies that are there? Uh, because end of the day, it's about compute. And as it evolves, uh, would it mean that cryptocurrencies would lose its value just because there is superior compute evolving? Um, it's possible, but I think, you know, just like there's quantum decryption, there's quantum encryption. A lot of it depends on how decentralized the tools for encrypting and decrypting are going to go. Um, and, uh, you know, that's to say, is, is it just going to be huge companies and governments that have them, in which case you won't be able to put in a quantum safe algorithm? Or is it going to be something where you can make quantum safe algorithm even without access to the quantum computer that quantum decrypts, right? I would also say that any such algorithm might not be applied to cryptocurrencies first. It could be applied to SSL and all kinds of other things. Um, but yes, that, that is a threat vector where you basically want to design quantum safe algorithms that can be executed either on local computers or relatively easily on quantum computers um, and hope those get distributed quickly. Thank you. Thanks, Balaji. That was helpful. Ashish, I'll hand it back to you. Great, great Balaji. How much time do we have you here for? Well, um, I, I mean, I, I was thinking I, I we'd finish in an hour or so, but if, uh, if you want to go much longer than that, um, you know, what were you thinking? No, I just have a couple of questions and then we can wind up if that's okay. Okay. All right. Sure. Let's do a couple more. Then. Okay, great. So, uh, one of the things that people worry about, uh, Bitcoin is the huge amount of volatility. I mean, typically the hallmark of any currency is stability, because if you want to exchange the currency for some goods or service, you want to be sure that if you go, you know, after a month, you get similar kinds of goods and services from that currency. And today there are central banks who are trying to control the float in, uh, you know, the central bank currencies. So how does one, uh, you know, how, how, I mean, how do you view that for Bitcoin? Okay. All right. Um, wait, hold on. Sorry. I just clicked the YouTube thing by accident. How do I do that for Bitcoin? Um, the, um, I, I think that what's actually going to happen, what is happening is that the, uh, it's, it's not so much that crypto becomes less volatile, it's that traditional markets become more volatile. Um, what you're seeing with, you know, GME on Wall Street, what you're seeing with Bill Huang's thing, um, what we're, you know, one way of thinking about fintech, right? Imagine if um, when you use Gmail uh, and you click send, that behind the scenes, it was printed out put on a Pony Express, you know, taken across the country, scanned, and then shown to the other guy's interface, right? And it just seemed like a long delay. And, you know, it was digital seeming, but there was this antiquated backend. That's actually a pretty good metaphor for FinTech and the legacy financial rails, especially in, in the US and Western countries. You know, they'll use Swift or FTP or something like that under the hood. They're doing daily wires. It's extremely, um, it's basically like, like postal mail, right? Under the hood. And, Fintech companies do a, a lot of work to try to make it seem like it's like the internet where you're just copying a file over from here to there, but sending money uses a much, as I mentioned, this antiquated system. And most of the time they can maintain that illusion, but once they get large workloads, unexpected workloads, uh, like what happened with Robinhood, you know, two months ago, three months ago, the, the abstraction, the leaky abstraction breaks down. And uh, so the old system is showing its age. You know, because people are using fintech to drive it in ways that it wasn't built for. It just simply wasn't built for these workloads. And so it seizes up, you know, or it causes crashes or huge nuts, people lose their money. And uh, I think that that is not going to go away. And what's going to happen is instead, um, everything gets cryptoified. And, and this is actually, I argue, good. The reason is that if you have volatility, um, there's a, there's a lot of work that people put in to suppress volatility and make people think that, oh, life is actually normally stable. For example, you know, when you go and buy an iPhone, right? There's actually all of these fluctuating commodity prices that go into Apple's supply chain for them to quote you a clean 599, 
right? There's like 37 cents for lanthanum here and, you know, manganese there or whatever it is. And these are all fluctuating. They do a ton of supply chain work, just give you a clean price. And you don't think about the fact that their profit margin varies as a function of all these commodities. And I think that a lot of the sort of volatility suppression stuff ends up trading short-term corrections, you know, so it flattens it out at the expense of long-term systemic risk that just crashes the whole system. So it's a little bit like working out. It's better to do like some each day uh, or even a lot each day than to have it all end loaded where there's this huge, you know, bailout and, you know, oh my God, everything is going to zero because, you know, Greenspan, for example, as this concept of like the, we talked about this plunge protection team where the Fed was just sort of manipulate the markets to stop them from going down. And then eventually what's going to happen is they'll go down hard enough and fast enough that the Fed can't do anything, you know, because it didn't kind of let the system rebalance. It was bailing people out of their bad decisions. Um, so that's what I think. I think essentially that, um, you know, volatility, th there are, by the way, so-called stable coins, you know, which use fiat as their backing and you can use those. And actually they're at $50 billion. And, you know, I helped launch one that's at like $11 billion called USDC. You can go to stablecoinstats.com and see them. But they're only stable in the sense that that fiat currency, underlying fiat currency is stable. And you might believe in that for the dollar. Uh, I'm not sure how long that's going to last. Um, other fiat currencies, obviously, like the Venezuelan, you know, Bolivar or what have you, are not very stable. Uh, so TLDR, I think we're going into a more volatile world. I think Wall Street and so on becomes more volatile. Even if crypto does slow down a little bit, I think the world becomes more volatile. And we just have to learn to live with that because volatility means upside, not just downside. Thanks. That's an interesting perspective. Before we wind up, I would definitely like you to talk about your initiative, 1729.com. I have oh, gone sure. and subscribed to it today, uh, and I found it to be a very, very interesting concept. Uh, so I'd like you to talk about it uh, you know, to our clients. Sure. Yeah. So I have um, a new site, 1729.com. So it's named after the Ramanujan number. You know, if you know the story of Ramanujan, you know, India's greatest mathematician, um, on his deathbed, his friend came to him and was trying to cheer him up and said, oh, the license plate number of this taxi, it's very boring, 1729. And, uh, you know, Ramanjan said, oh, it's not, it's not boring at all. It's the first number that's the sum of two cubes in two different ways. It's one cube plus 12 cubed and nine cubed plus 10 cubed. And I always thought that was really cute and cool. And, uh, you know, I've always wanted to basically, you know, see whether with the internet we could find the next Ramanjan, you know, because Ramanjan was... Um, you know, starving. And he was this super intelligent person who was almost lost to the world because his messages were almost sent to spam. And so now that we have all these mobile phones out there, can we find all these smart people around the world? Can we lift them up? Can we educate them? Just like Ramanujan was given math tutelage, he'd self-taught some, but he just needed a little bit of guidance, you know, could kind of just train them on the right thing. And then could have them achieve their full potential. And this is linked to crypto because you know, what I think is right now, everywhere there's a phone, there's an encyclopedia, but perhaps everywhere there's a phone, there's a job, you know, and an education. We can give people these problems. They, they do the, the problems, they level up, they get skills and they get higher paying tasks, a feed of tasks on their phone, just like you get a feed of tasks in, or like tweets in Twitter, except it's useful. You actually work on these and you actually do them, right? And if that, if we can do that, then, you know, India has these hundreds of millions of people and all these other countries have tens of millions of people that have just come online last five, five or so years. Um, and people talk about India as a, as a market um, and it is a market, but it could also be a digital factory, right? Where all those people are now put to work doing basically remote work, hitting one key at a time. And it could be what I call sort of digital blue collar work. Like, you know, is this a dog, is this a cat, you know, that kind of stuff. Uh, or it could be pretty sophisticated, like looking at perhaps teleradiology or something like that, if you can work out the licensing or giving an opinion on this or that engineering project. And it might only take you a minute to do it, but you might make 50 bucks because you know Python and that's actually a relatively in-demand skill. So one aspect of Centrifine is like this tasking concept where we want to get to the point that everywhere there's a phone, there's a job. And the second thing I'm doing with it, um, it's basically a newsletter that pays you. So every day you get tasks and you know, I, I guess your audience um, may not want to do, you know, a thousand dollar task or something like that. But I found it's an interesting way for me to sort of, uh, you know, right now I'm just self-funding it, just giving back so that all of these kids, influencers around the world can kind of get some cryptocurrency. Um, but now we're going to have sponsored tasks where a company will pay you a hundred bucks to go and make a demo with their API, right? 
And so you start to actually have something where it's not click on ads and be a blind consumer, you start to become a producer, right? So that's kind of a second dimension, producer internet versus consumer internet. And the third is I've got a book coming out called The Network State, which I've serialized and uh, you know putting up a chapter at a time on safety China. The first chapter is up today. Uh, and if you thought everything that we talked about today was crazy, well, this gets uh, even crazier where you know we talk about extending the ideas of um, cryptocurrencies to crypto cities and even crypto countries, right? If you know, if you think about it, what is um, you know uh, like Japan, right? It is a hundred something million uh, person country that has it's like a hundred million person social network that has its own currency called the yen, right? Just so happens all those people are on one island, and if you had a hundred million people online, that's basically like the same population size as Japan, maybe maybe the same purchasing power, maybe more if they're you know upper middle class or what have you. And um, why can't they have a currency? Just because they're all in you know, one place versus all distributed. Actually, the internet makes that pretty proximal. We're all effectively next to each other, even if we're you know, like, like physically separated or conceptually next to each other. And so that concept can be extended to cities and perhaps even to states themselves. And this is some of the stuff that I explore in this new book of mine, just kind of extending you know, <clears throat> what's happened over the last decade to the next two. Wow, that's very, very interesting. We look forward to the book, Balaji. But really, um, you know, I'd like to tell everybody, 1729.com, please spread the word. Uh, I mean, it sounds very, very interesting where, uh, you know, somebody can complete tasks and get paid for it. It's uh, basically, a, you know, distributed work system, uh, if I look at it very, very simply. And, uh, you know, I would uh, like everybody to subscribe as well as spread the word. So Balaji, really, thank you very much. I know it's a very complex subject and uh, maybe an hour is just not enough. But I think you've given us a great peek into the world of cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin, uh, uh, you know, uh, distributed ledger systems and some of the applications that are coming our way. And like you rightly said that whether uh, you believe in it or no, I think it's here to stay. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's better that we get educated and we learn about it uh, than, uh, you know, be left out because this, this probably is the future. So thank you very much again, Balaji, for spending time with us uh, today. It was really, really enlightening. Uh, and thank you very much uh, to everybody who has logged in today on the webinar as well as our live uh, stream on YouTube. Uh, thanks, Hari, for being here and doing this. Uh, uh, you know, uh, it, it was you made it interesting because uh, I thought you asked the most relevant questions today. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ashish. Thanks, yeah. Balaji. Thanks, Balaji. Thank you, everybody.